Compare the dialogue here from Reservoir Dogs released in 1992. These ladies aren't starving to death. They make minimum wage. And I used to work minimum wage, and when I did, I wasn't lucky enough to have a job the society deemed tip-worthy. You don't care they'd count on your tips to live? You know what this is? It's the world's smallest violin playing just for the waitresses. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. These people bust their ass. This is a hard job. So I was working at McDonald's, but... The to hear from Apocalypse Now, released in 1979. Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. <clears throat> Pick up Colonel Kurtz's path at New Mung Ba. Follow it, learn what you can along the way. When you find the Colonel, infiltrate his team by <clears throat> whatever means available and terminate the Colonel's command. Terminate. He's out there operating without any decent restraint, totally beyond the pale of any acceptable human conduct. And he is still in the field commanding troops. Terminate with extreme prejudice. Both of these scenes are quite similar. They involve the characters sitting around and having a meal, yet the dialogue is completely different. In Reservoir Dogs, the dialogue is irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the plot of the film. There are no stakes, no conflict. It's just a normal conversation between seemingly normal people. But for Apocalypse Now, the dialogue is extremely relevant to the plot. It occurs at the start of the film and outlines the journey the main character will go on. The stakes are high and the atmosphere is tense. In contrast, the atmosphere in Reservoir Dogs is much more relaxed. It's the very first scene of the film, yet it gives no indication of what will come next. You may think this seemingly irrelevant dialogue seen in Reservoir Dogs is simply a trademark of Tarantino, but it speaks to a wider trend that emerged during the 90s. This period saw a huge boom in American independent filmmaking, with many of the most prominent directors working today having their origins in this movement. Tarantino is of course the obvious example, but Wes Anderson, Spike Lee, Paul Thomas Anderson, Richard Linklater and many more also saw their beginning within the 90s. This style of irrelevant, conversational dialogue was a key characteristic of this new movement. In contrast, a general rule for films that came before this was that dialogue had to have a purpose. You wouldn't find the protagonist of a film from the 70s casually remarking upon what they call a Big Mac in France. But this new indie wave threw this rule out the window. Dialogue moved away from advancing the story and towards a more conversational style. Tarantino spearheaded this and receives much of the credit, but many other directors such as Kevin Smith and Noah Baumbach also adopted this style. Linklater's Dazed and Confused is comprised almost entirely of this conversational dialogue, a film that's essentially about high schoolers just hanging out and talking about things. You can find examples of this type of dialogue in films from the 70s and 80s, with the characters just lounging around and musing about life, but these are isolated examples, but it seems to be a staple of the new wave of indie films that emerged in the 90s. After the 70s introduced such names as Scorsese and Spielberg, and the industry entered into a new age of artistic expression with the new Hollywood movement, the balance of power shifted away from the studios and towards the filmmakers. But the 80s saw an overcorrection. After the breakout success of Jaws and Star Wars, studios realised that with the right films, they could make some immense profits. The industry became more commercial, capitalising on what made Spielberg and Lucas's films so popular. There was a string of high concept films that were easily understandable and marketable. The action film rose to prominence with Die Hard and Rambo and numerous imitators dominating the screens. The 80s also saw the rise of the slasher, low budget horror films that seemed to attract endless audiences, bringing in a high return on investment for the studios. But this left a gap in the market. Gone were the more artistic and stylistic films of the 70s, and gone was the auteurship that facilitated this. But a new generation was coming of age, a generation that was inspired by the likes of Scorsese and Coppola. They knew they wanted to make movies that were their own, rather than a paint-by-numbers studio piece. By the 90s, this generation had gone to film school and were in the position to rent cameras and start making their own films. Technology had evolved in such a way that filmmakers no longer needed a huge budget to make an effective film. Young filmmakers could showcase their directing and storytelling talents for a fraction of the cost of studio movies. Kevin Smith made Clerks for only $28,000, and Richard Linklater's first film Slacker was also done on a shoestring budget, yet both sold at Sundance for millions of dollars, skyrocketing the directors to respectable names in the industry. Tarantino is probably the most obvious and successful example, with the one-two punch of Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Both were low-budget pictures that attracted large-scale audiences, and Pulp Fiction earned upward of $200 million and was nominated for multiple Academy Awards. 
and it's not as if the studios lost out either, as they would adopt these directors after their breakout film, giving them a larger budget and creative free reign for their next project, and then cashing in the check when it was a box office success. This is the path Paul Thomas Anderson, Richard Linklater, Wes Anderson and Tarantino all followed. But what exactly were the trademarks of these new indie films? What made them unique, and how did they stand apart from the high concept blockbusters of the 80s? The specific kind of dialogue that emerged in the 90s is indicative of the type of films these indie directors were making. Gone were the high octane action flicks, films became more sombre and slower. Instead of focusing on life or death situations, they became much more grounded and relatable, showcasing ordinary people with ordinary lives. Think of Kicking and Screaming by Noel Baumbach, a film about a bunch of college graduates just hanging around, or The Big Lebowski with a plot that's akin to driving down a road and taking every left turn, constantly changing direction so that ultimately you arrive somewhere, but it's not really clear where. This lack of precise subject matter and an overall more relaxed, lower stakes vibe facilitated such conversational dialogue. You couldn't have a discussion over whether or not George Washington is in a cult in The Terminator, as the characters are too busy saving the world, but it's at home in a more chilled out film like Dazed and Confused. And George Washington, man, he was in a cult, and the cult was in the aliens, man. You didn't know that? No. Oh man, they were way into that type of stuff. Man. Tarantino is an exception to this, managing to blend the conversational dialogue and relaxed vibe with a more action oriented plot. The 70s had a more stylistic and director centric approach to filmmaking, but this was lost in the 80s. However, when the balance of power shifted back to the creators in the 90s, this sense of style became more prominent than ever. If we think of some of the most stylistic directors, the names that come to mind are often directors who entered the industry in this era. Wes Anderson, Tarantino, Tim Burton and many more auteur directors are from this period. Much like the 70s, strong anti-establishment sentiments were common and naturally this seeped into popular culture. Music is the most obvious example, with the likes of Nirvana and NWA releasing music with a strong rebellious sentiment. In filmmaking, these sentiments took the form of directors reclaiming ownership of their work. During the 80s the studios were king, exerting more influence over the films being made and the directors for the most part. But this new generation of directors wanted to put their own mark on their own work. As such, they injected a unique style to their films that no studio could replicate in good faith, making the films truly their own and not just a commercial product. And these new, more stylistic indie films were a hit with audiences. Previously, many viewed indie films as too pretentious, slow and boring, but this changed in the 90s. Tarantino is largely responsible for this with his films having a strong style and very clearly being of an independent nature, yet at the same time featuring bloodthirsty action and gripping characters and stories. His films often had high stakes, yet retained the relaxed vibe of other contemporary directors. He could flip-flop between discussions about Madonna's lack of virgin and a brutal torture scene. Other directors such as Spike Lee and Robert Rodriguez also helped change the reputation of indie films, with their work having a strong independent spirit and specific style while retaining the excitement and violence, attracting large-scale audiences. In the public consciousness, indie films were no longer just highbrow art house fare. This change in reputation allowed for bigger audiences and made them more awards friendly, but it's not as if they were entirely removed from the indie films of previous decades, with many older art house directors having an influence on this new generation. Unfortunately, one of the key influences on the new directors working in this period is Woody Allen. Annie Hall trailblazed the kind of conversational dialogue that came to the forefront in the 90s, with much of it centering around the main character's views on death and other such irrelevant conversation topics. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with, uh, with death, I think. Big, yeah. big subject with me, yeah. yeah. I have a very pessimistic view of life. You should know this about me if we're going to go out. You know, I, I feel that life is, is divided up into the horrible and the miserable. In a time when dialogue was like a game of computer-generated chess, where each character took turns to make observations that is wholly and entirely about the plot in lightning-fast fashion, Alan slowed this down to take a slower and more casual approach. This influence extends beyond a simple observation, with critics at the time immediately calling the likes of Noel Baumbach, Kevin Smith and Richard Linklater the children of Woody Allen, and Baumbach himself calling Allen the single biggest pop culture influence on me. Another big influence on the 90s indie movement is the French New Wave of the 50s and 60s. While these French films followed quite specific aesthetic and technical qualities, the American indie films of the 90s varied greatly in terms of style and genre, from the blood-soaked films of Tarantino to the sit-around-and-talk-about-life films of Richard Linklater. The most obvious influence of the French New Wave on American cinema is New Hollywood, but we can still see traces of its legacy well into the 90s. In order to highlight this influence, I'll look at two films, Anthony Ecolette, a 1962 short film by Francis Truffaut about a young man in Paris pursuing a girl who isn't interested in him, and Before Sunrise, 
1995 feature film about two strangers wandering through the streets of Vienna together who eventually fall in love. Both films share thematic elements. Long philosophical discussions about life, art, culture and love feature heavily. This was a recurrent element of French New Wave films, which often touched upon existentialism. The two films share lengthy long takes to highlight the connection between the characters, bringing the emotions to the forefront. In Anthony et Colette, Anthony is depicted gazing at Colette during a concert. J'étais assis juste derrière elle, enfin un peu à sa droite. À un moment, elle a retiré son foulard. Alors pendant toute la soirée, j'ai regardé ses cheveux et sa nuque. J'ai pas pu la quitter du regard. Ce soir-là, j'étais décidé à lui parler. À la sortie, je me suis faufilé pour la rejoindre. In Before Sunrise, Celine and Jesse listen to a song together in a booth, exchanging awkward and charged glances, both trying to look at each other, but not quite managing to. There are also strong parallels between the characters. Both Anthony and Jesse are writers with an interest in music who exude awkwardness and crave independence. This idea of newness is also present in both films. They are unlike much that came before them, signalling that a new era of filmmaking has arrived. For the American indie films, this new era came to a climax in the 1999 Academy Awards, when Shakespeare in Love won Best Picture over Saving Private Ryan. While far from the low-budget, independent flick that kicked off this movement in the early 90s, Shakespeare in Love was still in line with this new trend and was spearheaded by Miramax, which played a key role in the indie scene. In contrast, Saving Private Ryan was the epitome of the big-budget studio flick, directed by an established and heavyweight director in Spielberg, having an exciting and action-packed subject matter, it was a clear favourite for Best Picture. This was a symbolic defeat for the mainstream studios, but also signified that this new indie wave was coming to an end. Independent films have become so popular, they were becoming mainstream. By the end of the 90s, most of the major studios had set up subsidiary labels geared towards indie films. Fox had Fox Searchlight, and Universal had Focus Features. These subsidiary studios were still interested in indie films, but indie films became more awards-focused and crowd-pleasing, squeezing out genuinely independent-made films. Such films of this vein include Little Miss Sunshine and other early 2000s indie hits, the balance of power returned to favour the studios, directors lost the upper hand. Over time, these new subsidiary labels took less risk with their projects, and the indie gold rush seemed to be over, at least in spirit. The 90s stand as the last time when indie films were undoubtedly at the top of the food chain. Many powerhouse directors who act as key players in the industry today saw their genesis in this period, and its conversational dialogue, heightened sense of style and broader subject matters continued to influence cinema to this day.